Ever since the first planes were developed, the competition for superior security in the skies above our countries has been fierce. Since the development of the Rhine military flyer sold to the US Air Force in 1909, research and development has been tireless in the search for the ultimate aircraft. In 1951, the design team at Republic Aviation, an American aircraft manufacturer based in New York, began plans for a new supersonic single-seater tactical aircraft, which at the time they believed to be worthy of this title. Supervised by Russian-born aircraft designer Alexander Carvelli, this plane was to be capable of carrying not only air-to-air -air and air-to-surface missiles, but also a single nuclear bomb. On the surface, the project could probably not have been in better hands. Cart Valley had proven experience in plane design, having previously been involved in the production of, amongst others, the P-47 Thunderbolts, the F-84 Thunderjet, and the Republic F-84F Thunderstreak. This latest project, given the name AP, Advanced Project 63, was intended to develop a plane that was capable of replacing the Thunderstreak. Although there were many similarities, the newly designed F-105 Thunderchief was anticipated to be a far superior aircraft. Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Look, whether you're just starting out or managing and growing a successful brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place on your own terms. So let's dive into some of the amazing features that Squarespace offers. First of all, let's talk about Fluid Engine. With this next generation website design system, Squarespace unlocks unbreakable creativity. Starting with their best in class website templates, you can customize every design detail with their reimagined drag and drop technology. Whether you're on a desktop or mobile, you have the power to stretch your imagination. Fluid Engine is built in and it's ready to go on any new Squarespace site. And speaking of extending your website's functionality, Squarespace extensions are a game changer. You can connect your store to vetted third-party tools that take your website to the next level. Imagine integrating the tools you love seamlessly into your Squarespace site. It's like having a whole team of tech wizards at your disposal. Want to drive sales and engage your audience? Well, use Squarespace email campaigns. You can easily collect email subscribers and build connections through regular email updates. All you need to do is head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Just use the promo code megaprojects at checkout. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. And now back to it. Designed as a mid-wing monoplane with a 45% swept wing and tail, the F-105 also included wing root intakes and high wing loading. Designed to fly supersonic at very low altitude, the high wing loading ensured extra stability and less drag. However, it did make the plane less agile and create the need for longer takeoff and landing distances. With four pylons located on the wings, the inner set for in-flight refueling and the out of carrying missiles or bombs, the aircraft was not only capable of traveling many thousands of miles without landing, it could also carry an impressive 14,000 pounds of weapons, which included, as previously mentioned, their single nuclear bomb. In order to safely release this bomb, I mean, safely for those on the plane at least, a hatch under the plane was designed that slid up and into the vehicle rather than underneath, greatly reducing supersonic drag. The bomb itself was lowered for deployment on a hydraulic jack to ensure accuracy and sufficient clearance from the aircraft. Although this was a key design feature, it was never actually used. Bombs were rarely stored in the bay, and it would commonly hold an extra 350 gallon or 1300 liter fuel tank. If you top off all of these specifications with an intended top speed of Mach 1.5 or 1151 miles per hour, then on paper at least, you have a fairly impressive bit of kit. And it's little wonder that the first of the designs, the 105A, was approved by the Air Force in 1952. Of course, at this time, America was deeply involved in the war between North and South Korea, and the first order from the US Air Force was for 100 19 planes. However, only two of the initial design were ever made. In 1953, the US Air Force had reduced the order to only 37, giving uh, one of the reasons for this decision as there being too many delays in development. With the end of the war in Korea also appearing to be a distinct possibility, the whole program was cancelled by the US Air Force towards the end of 1953, only to be reinstated in February 1955 with a firm order of 15 planes. With ongoing technological and avionic unreliability, confidence in the plane continued to waver. Despite the uncertainty certain future of the Thunder Chief and the constantly changing operational requirements, tests continued. However, it would not be until the 22nd of October 1955 that test pilot Russell Rusty Roth took to the skies in the first YF-105A. A second aircraft was to follow in January 1956. The prototype reached top speed of around Mach 1.2 on its first flight. Unfortunately, as the pilots attempted to land, the front landing
steering wheel failed to lower, and the pilot was forced to make an emergency landing using only the rear wheels. Although he was uninjured, there was already criticism of the project for economic reasons as well as that of slow progress, and this landing feature did nothing to quell the diminishing support for the program. With this at the forefront of the designers' minds, adjustments were swiftly made to the landing gear. The cause of the nose failure was discovered to be a relatively simple matter of the air intake controls getting in the way of the descending wheel and was quickly rectified. Another more consistent problem was of transonic drag. To put this in simple terms, during a flight at the speed of sound, both the aircraft and the shockwaves move at the same speed. This causes a buildup, creating one large shockwave in front of the aircraft, which it must then fly through. The faster the aircraft flies, the more the shockwave pushes back against it. This was addressed in newer prototypes by modifying the fuselage and creating a narrowing towards the rear of the aircraft, sometimes known as a wasp waist or slim hip. One test in which the F-105 seemed to excel was the spin test. These tests are as alarming as they sound and are understandably unpopular with pilots. The test requires the pilot to deliberately lose control of the aircraft, allowing it to spin downward toward the earth. Although a recovery parachute is attached to the rear of the plane, the pilot must try and regain control of the often stalled aircraft after a certain amount of time. Thankfully, the F-105 performed well in these tests, with pilots and observers noting that the F-105 had a natural tendency to level out after rotation. As research continued, an important development challenge in the production of the 105 was the ability to refuel during flights. Although this was widely used technology on fighter jets, the size and weight of the 105 made refueling a much more difficult task. In order to connect to the much slower fuel tanker, the 105 had to slow down to such an extent that maneuverability was badly affected. Added to this, flying within the turbulence of the tanker led the 105 to stall regularly. Initially, control of the refueling was the responsibility of the pilot in the 105. Holding the plane steady amid the turbulence and at dangerously low speeds, he was expected to maneuver the plane onto the fuel hose or drogue line connected to the other aircraft. After many understandably unsuccessful attempts, it was decided that control should be given to an operator in the other plane, while the 105 just had to remain steady whilst also not stalling the engine. Although this was more efficient, many refueling tests and modifications to the tankers themselves were to follow, and it wasn't until jet tankers were used that mid-air refueling of the 105 was considered a successful and reliable procedure. Following all the delays and continuous changing order and operational requirements, in 1958, the 355th Tactical Air Squadron were the first to take delivery of the 105B Thunder Chief. With so much controversy surrounding the development and production, the reception from the Air Force was mixed. The Thunder Chief had already earned the rather unfortunate nickname of Thunder Thud, or Thud the Lead Sled. This was due to its weight and size. However, this reputation was about to change. When the first flights took place and the world's speed record was broken, the aircraft's popularity soared. With the capacity to carry 14,000 pounds of weaponry, including bombs, rockets, air-to-surface missiles, and sidewinder missiles, coupled with the performance achieved after so much research and many adaptions, the thuds became popular among pilots, and the nickname changed from being disparaging to one of affection. Despite the initial favorable reception from the Air Force, though, in 1962, further problems led to the grounding of the entire fleet. But finally, in 1964, the then 105D model of the Thunder Chief began to prove itself as the outstanding model it had been expected to be. America had become involved in the Vietnam War in the 1960s, partly in a bid to stop the spread of communism from north to south, and in support of the Republic in the South who wished to remain independent. The war dragged on with no real progress, either through firepower or diplomatic relations. At an estimated cost of $2.2 million, and equipped with the larger and more powerful Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine, the 105D began service in Vietnam, and soon earned a reputation as the one-man army aircraft. The third was able to demonstrate its physical strength with the ability to sustain damage while in battle, and yet return to base to be repaired and reflown time after time. According to a book by Peter E. Davis, one pilot, Murray Denton, said, My first impression of the F-105 was how large and roomy the cockpit is. Coming from the F-106 Delta Dart, I couldn't believe the long takeoff roll. I remember the night flights with three bags of fuel and water injection for more thrust. We would always use all the runway and milk the flaps up. The faster it flew, the better it got. It operated well at sea level, 15,000 feet, and in military power, the jet would run faster than any other aircraft at low level. It just didn't turn much. It also had a great gun and was a very stable bomber that could take hits and come home. At the airbases, maintenance of the planes was constant and required experienced operators to be at the end of the phone in case their expertise was required. Regular engineers worked day and night to service, repair, and reload the aircraft. The construction of the fuselage was such that panels could be removed to make any internal repairs easy to access while also allowing the panels themselves to be replaced. Every day, around 90% of the 105Ds were ready to take off, and with the addition of all-weather navigation systems now added to the slightly longer nose of the 105D, they could fly under any conditions. 
610 105Ds were eventually deployed in Vietnam, completing an outstanding 75% of all attack missions carried out in the first five years of their arrival. Still, the reputation of the Thunder Chief continued to grow. Even when coming up against the formidable Russian MiGs, their power and speed allowed them to remain dominant in the skies above Vietnam while managing to bring down a reported total of 28 MiGs. As the war continued, the expected duration of the flights became longer as the Thuds made further inroads into northern Vietnam, their targets becoming more distant. Land strikes were reported to be successful, with hundreds of targets, including communication stations, bridges, and roads in North Vietnam being destroyed, despite the use of old, notoriously inaccurate iron bombs from the Second World War. With so many flights, often at top speed and long distance, the Thunder Chief's theoretical fatigue lifetime started to become an important consideration. The expected working life of a plane of this type was 4,000 hours of flight time, and from June 1967, several of the planes had reached the halfway point. The engines, often running at full power with the afterburners on, was the component of the aircraft causing the greatest concern. In order to alleviate some of the strain, it was decided they should be serviced every 125 flight hours instead of the current 200. One pilot was reported to have flown a plane that had not only sustained previous damage, but had flown for 3,000 hours, completing 500 missions. But until a suitable replacement was available, the thuds would continue to fill the skies above North Vietnam, continuing their job as well as they could until the end of the war. As much as pilots loved the plane, according to information from the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas, losses were extremely high, with the chances of a Thunder Chief pilot surviving surviving their 100 missions put at only 75%. When the Vietnam War ended, the 105Ds were no longer needed and were replaced by newer models. The remaining aircraft were passed down for training, and the last recorded flight of a Thunder Chief 105D was on the 25th of May, 1978.